Hi, this week's First Chapter Friday is Falling Short by Ernesto Cisneros. And this is a book with kind of a sports theme about two kids who play basketball together and are both kind of dealing with their own sort of family issues. And I'm very happy that it's nice enough that I'm able to spend our time together reading outside today. So let's see what the first chapter or two has to share. So this is a book with alternating chapters, um, kind of taking the first person perspective of each of the characters. So the first chapter is Isaac. Marco's repeated tapping on my window sounds like Morse code. Really, really loud Morse code. I try to open my eyes, but my left one is being stubborn and refuses to obey. Go away, Marco, I say, almost pleading. Five more minutes. Nope, it's our first day of sixth grade at Mendez Middle School. You agreed we should get to school extra early. You were very clear and made me promise to ignore anything you said, including bribes or threats. Marco's fingertips tap dance against the window. You know I'm going to keep going until you get up. It's not his fault. I did ask for help. It's just hard after last night. I mean, I know that parents sometimes argue. And that it's normal. It's part of life. I get that. But last night, Appa came in to talk with Amma. And I had a tough time sleeping through the yelling. All right, fine. My left eye finally cooperates. I kick off my sheets and walk over to the open window. The tip of Marco's nose is squished flat against the glass, almost eye level with, my, with me. This is strange, because normally, even on his tiptoes, Marco can barely get his chin past my door, my windowsill. You know the saying, good things come in small packages? Well, whoever said that was probably talking about Marco. Fun-sized is what he likes to call himself, which is way better than being called adorable, which he gets a lot. I wouldn't be surprised if he came home from middle school with bruises on his cheeks from all the older kids, especially the girls, squeezing his face as if he were some sort of stuffed animal. A word of advice? Don't ever do that. He hates it. Hates hearing how cute he is. Unless, of course, you are his dad, who refers to him as his own little juju bean. After the amazing juju bee's candy, on account of Marco being half Jewish, half Mexican. Well, at least that's what he used to call him before the divorce. Anyway. Marco Honeyman is his whole name, and he can't stand getting picked up off the ground and twirled around like a rag doll, something that happened all the time in elementary. The thing is, he won't say anything about it. He's just wired like that, really polite, really nice, and super responsible. Nothing like me. I slide the window all the way open. Marco looks wide awake. His hair is slicked and parted, and his shirt is buttoned to the top in Marco fashion. Of course he's ready. I reach out my hand, offering to help him in, like I usually do most mornings. Only Marco holds up his hand. Nope, not today. I got this. I stand back and watch him leap inside. It's the most athletic thing I've ever seen him do. Before I can say a word, he leans outside the window and pulls in what looks like a small rolling cooler. Whoa, what is that thing? Marco shortens the length on his telescoping handlebar and wheels it over to me. I look closer. Wait, what? Dude, is that a rolling backpack? Not just any backpack, he says, patting down the side. This is a zippa. Not only will it keep me from hurting my back, it doubles as a chair. Or a step stool, I say, pretending to step on his zippa. Really? Are you height shaming me? Marco says, with a gleam of laughter in his eyes, because I will leave right now. Ultimately, he shoots me a toothy grin. That's too bad, I say back, because I'm starting to smell pancakes and bacon coming from the kitchen, and you know how my Emma is always trying to fatten you up. Marco scratches his chin and pretends to be thinking the offer through. Hmm. Fine, he finally answers. You're just lucky I don't offend easily. We both laugh. Come on, I say, let's eat. Sounds good, but uh, maybe you should put on some pants first. He's right. I am getting too old to be running around my house in my underwear. I go over to my desk chair, reach for the school clothes I picked out last night, and spread my new jeans and favorite Lakers Nation jersey along the side of my bed, the shirt Appa got me the last game we went to together. Marco comes over and examines my choice of clothes. Wow, I'm really impressed. He holds up my boxer briefs by the waistband. You even picked up a pair of clean chonies and everything. Clean, I answer, as straight-faced as possible. What makes you think those are clean? He immediately drops them, jokingly wiping his hands along the side of his shirt. Dude, that is gross.
Ama is in the kitchen, sipping on the same iced coffee she makes at the start of every week. Only this morning, after last night, she's drinking it out of an oversized thermos. Buenos dias, mijos, she says, not at all surprised to see Marco joining us for breakfast. After so many years, it's now kind of expected. Marco's eyes double in size, and he licks his lips at the buffet laid out before us. Fluffy scrambled eggs, bacon, sausage, watermelon scoops, and smiley face pancakes stacked high. Yup, Ama's definitely gone a bit overboard with breakfast, even for her. Wow, are you expecting company? Marco asks. Ama smiles, only my favorite visitor. She leans in and gives him a big squeeze. Marco wraps his arms around her, smiling. My Ama is one of the few adults he gives free passes on hugs. See, she says mid-hug, Marco doesn't mind my hugs, do you? Apparently, she's bitter after I told her I was too big for hugs now that I'm starting sixth grade. Making sure I get the point, Ama comes close and offers me a straight-armed handshake. I go ahead and lock hands, only her mom instincts prove to be too strong, and she pulls me in, squeezing me like an old tube of toothpaste. Fine, I say, you can hug me here at home, just not at school. Ama crosses herself, promising to try. I take a seat at the table next to Marco. There's a second plate waiting for me. It's a lot of food, but I'm used to it. Ama's like that at work, too. Always cooking up a feast. When I think about it, I'm not sure she knows how to make a small meal. If it wasn't for her, our family restaurant, El Comedor Castillo, well, back when it used to be one, would have gone under years ago. She works long shifts and does stuff an owner shouldn't be doing. But that's Ama for me, for you, not too proud to unclog a toilet if needed. Too bad Apa's contracting job takes so much of his time. She could really use the help. Ama hands Marco a bottle of ketchup. Thank you, Mrs. Castillo. Ama bites her lower lips and sighs. Marco, just so you know, I won't be going by that name any longer. You can call me by my maiden name, Ms. Anguiano, or Isaac's mom. That works, too. My heart sinks. Amaz mentioned changing her last name before, but that doesn't make it any easier to hear. She's been pressing Apa to sign the final of divorce papers, but he keeps stalling, keeps telling her that they could work things out, keeps promising to quit drinking. Well, Miss Anguiano, I promise to remember. Ama smiles and gives him a second hug. Me, I fight back the urge to fling a pancake at him. Hey, Marco, I call out, interrupting the hug. Don't you need to wash your hands before you eat? I know I'm acting all semi-aggressive, but I just don't like the idea of Ama and me no longer sharing a name. Marco looks down at his hands. Yeah, I probably should, especially after touching your chonies. Isaac's mom crinkles her nose but doesn't ask. I'll be right back, he turns to Ama. Do you mind, Ms. Aguiano? Ang Anguiano? Sweetie, you practically live here. When are you going to stop asking? Marco blushes and heads toward the hallway bathroom. Que niño tan lindo, says Ama. Sure hope you meet more friends like him in middle school today. Suddenly, we hear a screech, which I assume is coming from Abuelita, who moved in with us after Abuelito passed away. I rush over and find Marco frozen in place just outside the bathroom. Only the screeching is coming from him with hands over her his eyes. Inside, Abuelita is sitting on the toilet. She seems as alarmed as Marco. Fortunately, her long flannel gown protects my eyes. Sorry, Abuelita, I answer back. Ay, Dios mío, she answers. Se me olvidó a trancar la puerta. Means I forgot to lock the door. She says that every time she forgets to set the bathroom lock. I close my eyes and shut the door for her. Ama, otra vez? My ama holder, hollers at her, at her ama from the kitchen. How many times do I need to remind you? I'm not sure why ama gets mad. It's not Abuelita's fault she sometimes forgets. It's just like when I forget my homework on my bed, or like when I misplace my cell phone, or forget to put on deodorant in the mornings. I don't do these things on purpose either. They just happen. Guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Apa forgets things too. Mostly small promises though, like his promise to help me perfect that Euro step all those NBA guys are doing. It's pretty much a matter of picking up your dribble taking a long step, then quickly cutting in another direction. The move looks simple enough, only it's not. Apa says it's tough move to master, but I'm not about to let that stop me, not if I plan on taking my game to the next level. The thing with Apa, sometimes the promises he breaks are bigger, 
like the one he made to Amma about getting help. Who knows? If Apa can stop drinking, maybe Amma will give him another chance, like she's doing with me this school year. Amma says middle school is my chance at finally becoming mas responsable, which means no more forgetting my lunch, no more missing homework, no more detentions, no more bad grades, and most importantly, no more tears for Amma, at least not because of me. That's why I asked Marco to come over so early, to guarantee I didn't oversleep and mess things up again. Most of my parents' arguing is centered around me and all my low grades. Apa says basketball is teaching me all about discipline and responsibility, while Amma argues it's an added distraction. It's tough to know who's right. All I know is that basketball is the only thing I'm really, really good at. Hopefully this year I can change that by getting good grades and finally becoming the son my parents always wanted, the son they deserve. And maybe then we can stay a family. Chapter 2, Marco. Isaac is so lucky. His mom makes the best food. Real buttermilk pancakes with deli-cut bacon slices as thick as my pinky fingers. And did I mention the freshly squeezed orange juice? There's so much pulp, it's like biting into a fresh orange. So good. After stuffing my face with seconds and thirds, I head back home, where a bowl of soggy oatmeal and a burnt slice of toast wait for me. I take a seat at the table and stare down at my plate. Let me guess, says Mom, you ate next door again, right? I consider telling her that I didn't, but not only would that mean lying to her, it would also mean having to eat her food. And I'm not really sure my stomach can handle either one. Somehow, Mom seems to know the truth because she leans in and gives me a squeeze. Next time, be sure and bring me back a plate. I nod and give her a kiss on the cheek. I'm lucky my mom isn't bothered by her inability to cook. She says that running her own real estate agency is her way of feeding me. I check my smartwatch for the weather. My watch predicts an 82 degree day, so I go to my room and trade in my jacket and tie for a simple vest instead. Isaac's bedroom light is on. I look over to see if he's ready. I'm guessing not by the way he's running around like a madman with a toothbrush dangling from his mouth. Poor Isaac. He gets like this whenever things don't go as planned, like last night. Even with my window closed, I could hear everything his parents were screaming, including the name calling. His dad isn't happy about having to move out or the custody arrangement. Says he wants Isaac on weekdays too. But his mom hollered at him about getting help for his drinking and pointed out how lucky he was to even be getting Isaac on the weekends. I can't imagine what it's like. No, not the divorce part. I get that. My parents are divorcing too. What I don't get is the whole custody battle thing. My dad never bothered fighting over me. Not that I blame him. I'm not the kind of son you can brag about to all your friends. My dad was a star athlete and the most popular kid at school. Nothing like me. Mom tries to make me feel better by pulling out all, all old photo albums and reminding me about the stuff dad used to do with me, like when I was little, well, littler, and he signed me up for a soccer league during my kindergarten year. Talk about being a disappointment. I spent more time on the ground than I did upright. I can pretty much picture poor dad having to stand there, pretending to be so proud of me. The only thing that saved me was having my neighbor and best friend, Isaac, on the same team. At first, I thought he was aggressive because of how fearlessly he played, but he was the only one who ever ran over to help me anytime I got bumped onto the ground. Before I knew it, he started sticking up for me. At one point, he even threatened to kick anyone who stole the ball from me. Too bad he couldn't do much about the name calling coming from the sidelines. No, not the kids, the parents. Who would have thought that grown-ups could be even crueler than kids? I completely understand why my dad stopped going to my games. I completely understand why he stopped calling around, coming around altogether. And I completely understand how Isaac must be feeling. Only, I don't want him knowing that I know. I mean, we talk about serious stuff like that all the time. It's kind of our thing. Probably the only thing we have in common. But I'm not about to bring up what happened last night on our first day of middle school. Again, I peek over at Isaac's window. No sign of him this time, just the glare coming from the massive MVP ba basketball trophy beside his bed. I turn to the trophies in my room. Spelling Bee Champion, Principal's Honor Roll, Top Reader, Times Table Titan, Principal's Choice Award. All geek awards, nothing my dad could brag about. 
That's why this year, things are going to change. Don't get me wrong. I am still planning on getting straight A's and having perfect attendance. But I'm also going to try out for a sport. Something not so physical. Something that community kids can play too. Whatever it is, I hope it makes Dad proud enough to want to show up and cheer me on. So I'm sure you can already see some of the kind of parallels between these two kids in this story. I hope you check out Falling Short. It is on this year's um, Golden Dome Award list for Vermont, and it's a great book. Check it out.